So I'm pleased to be here today, and I hope what I can share is a different perspective on rare disease drug development and the type of impact that you can have both in your professional and personal lives. So I'm here on behalf of the Rare Genomics Institute. We're a virtual nonprofit, and all of us at the Rare Genomics Institute are volunteers. So in my professional life, uh, I have a background in the CRO industry, uh, PhD in genetics, CRO industry, and my current role is in pharma, but I'm here on behalf of the Rare Genomics Institute, which is my personal, part of my personal endeavors that complement uh, my professional endeavors. Okay. So as you know, there are more than 7,000 rare diseases that affect over 300 million patients globally. However, there are only therapies available for less than 5% of those diseases. So what do we do at the Rare Genomics Institute? So we've taken a very novel approach, an innovative approach, on how to help advance rare disease research and treatment. We help families, we start with the patients, and we help them design and implement one-of-a-kind research programs from a bottom-up patient-driven perspective. So how do we do that? We provide guidance in the study design, access to a research team, and access to capital. So if you think about it from a slightly different perspective, the approach that we take at Rare Genomics is we're all scientists. Uh, we all know each other um, through grad school, through, through different endeavors. And we feel very fortunate as scientists that we have this training. We have access to an incredible network of scientists around the globe, access to expertise. And if it was our loved one, our parent, our child, our sibling, our spouse that had a rare disease or an undiagnosed rare disease, what would we personally do to move forward diagnosis and treatment? And it's with that perspective that I'll be sharing with you the approach that we take at Rare Genomics. So I'm going to focus on, on two of the models that we're using. The first is personalized research, how we create personalized research projects. So when you think about the prevalence of different diseases, there's a large number of rare diseases in which there are no formal advocacy groups, no foundations, no research, no grants. And in some cases, there are many patients that don't even have a diagnosis. They're on a diagnostic odyssey. It's something rare. They, they have gone to many specialists over many years. And there's a gap there. There's help that's needed. And this is what we do here really complements the type of efforts that are underway and have been very successful by the NIH and the Rare Diseases Research Program. So what we do at Rare Genomics is try and help those families that don't have access to the same networks, the scientists, the knowledge that, that we at Rare Genomics have. And we provide access to technologies, to clinicians, and novel ways to access capital to fund that. So our team of scientists and clinicians cur currently design custom research projects that are personalized to each patient in each disease. And I'll be sharing with you the results of our pilot studies this past year where we've been focused on on sequencing, and I'll be talking a bit about our next steps and how we help, hope to be able to help patients um, once, once they know the genetic basis of their disorder. So these are some examples of the children that we're helping. David, River, Graham, and Sabrina are some of the patients um, which are working with rare genomics. The way that it works is if there's a family that has a child or, or it doesn't have to be a child with an undiagnosed rare disorder, they reach out to our patient advocacy team. Our patient advocacy team will talk with them and understand exactly what their needs are and pair them up with someone in our network of researchers uh, that works with us and pair them up with a clinician. The clinician will then evaluate their medical records and determine whether they'd be a good candidate for sequencing. And if so, they then come back to us and I'll, I'll share with you how we, how we help them. These are some of the other patients, some of the other children that we're working with, Windsor, Maya, Robert, and Sela, and I'll be talking with you a little bit more about Maya in a bit. So these are some of our partners. We actually have about 18 different academic centers that are collaborating with us. So we refer patients to see the clinicians. We feel it's very important that uh, their sequencing is handled um, by clinicians. And these are the academic centers where we have clinicians and sequencing facilities that we work with. So how are patients going to pay for sequencing? In many cases, these are one-of-a-kind patients. There may not be research programs available. There may not be researchers that are interested in uncovering the genetic basis. 
So at Rare Genomics, we really work hard to break down barriers to access for families with rare diseases. So I mentioned access to experts, um, access to technologies like sequencing, and then finally, access to capital. So we've taken advantage of innovations in social media and crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. And so on our site, we host crowdfunding for patients uh, that are going through our process. Patients can choose to self-pay for the sequencing. Um, typically, it's between $2,500 and $7,500 um, for a range of, of these aspects. And what the families do is they put a picture of, of their child or their family on our site, along with a brief description um, about their child and their child's symptoms. And they can then use that in the same way as if I were doing, let's say, a breast cancer walkathon. And I had a web page to fundraise for a breast cancer walkathon. I could email my friends, my colleagues, my family. They could forward to their friends, family, and colleagues and ask them to help donate. And so in that way, We've raised $50,000, which uh, goes directly um, to the sequencing facilities. As I mentioned, we're all volunteers at Rare Genomics, so, uh, so we don't get a salary. It all goes uh, to help these families. Typically, as I mentioned, it ranges from $2,500 to $7,500 that they're raising. The average donations, in our experience, has been about $50, with approximately 150 people donating. And I should say, when you look at the list of, of people that are making donations, it's not just their friends and their family. There are a lot of anonymous donors, sometimes small amounts, sometimes large amounts, but through the power of the crowd, it can really add up and make a difference in a single child's life. So you might be curious, how long does it take for a family to raise this money? Um, in some cases, just a day. Uh, in other cases, it can take several months. And we work with the families to try and help them uh, increase uh, awareness and, and help them with raising money. Okay. So in our first pilot year, uh, we've been working with 18 research sites, pairing um, patients with families with clinicians and, and sequencing access. Uh, we're working with over 50 different researchers, and we're also expanding globally into Singapore, Malaysia, Israel, Spain, Australia, and the UK. Um, currently, we are actually helping families internationally, even without um, having all these different sites up and running. And to just give you some perspective on, on the power of access to technology, to clinicians, and uh, using crowdfunding, uh, one of the patients we've been able to help, uh, his father's a coal miner in Chile, and he's able to raise a several thousand dollars using um, crowdfunding to have his child sequence. So there's really a lot of power, not just within the U.S., but globally, in order for um, patients to actually have sequencing be accessible to them. So we've received over 200 applications from families, and we have 19 projects underway, and I've shown you some pictures of some of the children that, are currently, um, that we're currently working with. We've completed three so far, and I'll be talking with you next about some of our large-scale campaigns. Um, so in total, with crowdfunding and the campaigns I'll be talking about, we've been able to raise over $700,000 in some different and innovative ways. So I've talked with you about how we customize um, sequencing and research programs for the individual patient, and now I want to talk with you about how at Rare Genomics we feel that we can support um, specific rare diseases as well through different ways of, um, of raising money. So in this part of my presentation, I'll be talking um, about, in general, diseases, rare diseases, where there are advocacy groups, foundations, research, and some grants, um, but they could definitely benefit um, from added resources. So in honor of Rare Disease Day 2012, we launched the Rare 99X Challenge in collaboration with WashU St. Louis, uh, their genomics and pathology services. And in that challenge, we were awarding 99 clinical grade whole exome sequences to disease advocacy groups. So we received over 60 letters of interest, uh, which led to 15 full proposals, and there are four, that, four different advocacy groups that received uh, the awards. The 99 clinical exome sequences were distributed amongst those four diseases, and I've listed them here. And those are currently underway, and we hope that um, through this uh, unique approach and this challenge that we'll be able to um, help identify some of the genetic basis for some of these disorders. Um, the type of um, patients that we're, help, that we're working with in this um, range from some trios, so some parent-children uh, triads, as well as in cases some multi-generational families uh, in which these families have uh, each of the um, nodes of the family each have at least two affected children, um, as well as in some cases looking at unrelated individuals that all share the same disorder. 
In honor of Rare Disease Day 2013, we took a different approach. Um, as I mentioned in my professional life, I have a background in the CRO industry. And so when I was running a lab in, in a boutique CRO, um, what I found was that um, you, know, you have expertise in a certain area. And when you have sort of a good working flow in your lab, it's very easy to sort of toss in some pilot studies without really impacting uh, the workload in general. And so, so we partnered with, with Assay Depot and took this approach of instead of asking um, contract research organizations for money, what if we asked them to donate their expertise? and have researchers, nonprofits, so whether it's foundations, advocacy groups, or, or researchers, ask them to apply for these services to help advance the rare diseases that they're studying. So this would be a way that, um, that scientists and, 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 and folks in the CRO industry can really try and give back using their core expertise, and that rare disease researchers can benefit from it. So this is just a snapshot of uh, what we put together in this unique challenge this past year. Um, it says 400,000, but uh, we actually had about 500,000 plus in donated research services. And this is from over 20 different companies. And the donated services ranged everything from custom creation of antibodies to a custom knock-in or knock-out mouse to gene expression studies, um, just really covering the whole spectrum, um, sequencing, access to collaborative uh, drug development software, um, consulting. Uh, so really a, a wide range of different types of services um, that we made available to, to the nonprofit uh, and research community. And in addition, SA Depot um, donated $10,000 to be awarded as a cash prize. And so again, not taking a, a typical approach, we took a slightly different approach to how that would be awarded. Uh, we feel it's important not just to raise money and, and fund research and, and help individual families, uh, but it's also important to raise awareness um, for the rare disease communities. And so the approach that we took to award the $10,000 research prize um, was to use a, a panel of experts that are listed here, so well-known um, well people in, in industry and in academia and in the rare disease world. And we utilize these experts to evaluate uh, the scientific merit of the proposals along with some of the rare genomics experts. And from that, we're able to narrow down over 100 applications to the top 10. And we then uh, launched on, on Rare Disease Day this past year, voting for uh, amongst those 10 uh, finalists to select the winner of the $10,000 prize. And so over 33,000 votes were cast uh, in our Facebook vote. And uh, the winner was Dr. Chang, who's studying Rett syndrome and a particular gene, uh, MECP2. This wasn't really meant for you to read all of them, but just to show you the wide range of uh, services that we awarded um, as part of this challenge, and just to impress upon you that, um, that there are so many ways that, that you can give back, um, both in your professional and, and personal lives. And this was just a really wonderful example of, of many companies who maybe hadn't specifically focused or done work in the rare disease space before, um, but were really excited um, to make an impact uh, using, using their expertise and, and donating their excess capacity. Um, so it was really exciting to be a part of, uh, of, of something where so many different groups came together in support of, of rare disease research. So what we really aim to provide at Rare Genomics is a complete solution to combine all these aspects together that otherwise wouldn't exist and to be able to work with families to empower them um, and to give them hope. So you're probably wondering, I mentioned that there were three studies uh, that we had completed this year. So I'm guessing you're wondering, did we find anything? <laughs> Was it helpful? Uh, did we actually make an impact for any of these families? Um, so we actually uh, did find mutations for the three patients uh, that we worked with. Um, one of them actually garnered us quite a bit of media coverage uh, for Maya. Uh, it, was, it was listed as you know, the world's first crowdfunded genome sequencing um, project for Maya. And so, so we got quite a bit of crowd uh, quite a bit of media coverage. Um, for the two other patients, we also found mutations in, in different genes. One was a compound heterozygous mutation in PKKRA, if anyone is familiar with that gene. And another was in a gene ORP1L. And what we're really working to do now is really take this a step further. So whether uh, a patient's mutation is identified through us, whether it's identified through other means, um, 
the ownership of that uh, isn't important to, to rare genomics. What really matters is that we're providing an avenue, a mechanism, and a way for families to be able to find a diagnosis for their children. And once they find a diagnosis, what can they do about it? What would you do if it was your own child? I know what I would do. I would reach out to all the researchers I knew. I would, I would put together you know, experts. I would try and see what research could actually be accomplished. I would get in the lab myself and do it. Um, and we want to make that accessible um, to other families to the extent possible. Um, we really feel that um, you know, every child should have that hope, every family should have the hope. Um, and as the Senator mentioned earlier, we want to try and unlock those prisons uh, for those families, no matter how rare the disease, even if it's an N of 1 disease. So as far as next steps, um, what we're really working to do is, is take it beyond the identification of the mutation. Um, we're working with a variety of different um, companies, a variety of different collaborations, a variety of different researchers. So once there's a mutation that's known, we're working to um, access through our, our panel of experts as well as other interested scientists who have expertise in those areas and work to custom design research research programs. Um, one of the benefits now of the proliferation of CROs is that um, you really can run a virtual biotech. Um, and so it really is possible to um, have families um, and groups really galvanize to really initiate research if, if research doesn't exist. And so these are some of the examples of, of some of the different companies and, and partnerships that we're working on. And uh, we're very open to innovative ideas and, and approaches, and I certainly welcome any of you here to come and talk with me if there are ways that you think uh, either professionally or personally uh, would be of interest uh, to you regarding working with rare genomics. Um, so finally, I, I should just point out that we've been very fortunate to have a good amount of press coverage, which, um, which definitely helps us as far as um, raising awareness um, for families that may be struggling and, and don't know where to turn next. And even more so, we're very thankful to all of our sponsors and, and supporters. Uh, we've had over 40 different companies that have, and organizations that have worked with us and supported us to, to make these efforts um, possible. So we're deeply indebted to, to all the effort that, that they put in, again, professionally and, and personally. Um, so this is the, the core team of, of Rare Genomics. Um, and unfortunately, Jimmy Lin wasn't able to be here today, but he's the, the founder and was a TED Fellow in 2012. And we've also been assembling an, an expert panel that um, has worked with us in our challenges, as well as um, when families come to us with specific mutations, we reach out to them um, as far as guidance on, on next steps and, and researchers they may know that, that may provide expertise. Um, so we're very indebted to all of the donated brain power uh, and support from, uh, from our expert panels, as well as all the companies we work with. So thank you. Do we have any question for Marisa? Thank you, Marisa, for this presentation. I think for someone who jumped at the last moment, you did beautifully. Uh, Thank you. Any comment, question? Is all crystal clear? Yes, please, if you can have it. Uh, great talk. Thank you, Marissa. I met you earlier, and so I was really pleased to hear the presentation. This crowdsourcing model, um, uh, do you run that yourself, or do you work through a Kickstarter type of subsidiary? Uh, how, how are you able to... Um, to do that functional right so um, so we're running it through through another company obviously one of the challenges that most of the companies out there will charge a, a certain amount um, for using their site uh, so we're currently working on uh, some potential collaboration so that literally every dollar of what's raised can go to help the families without subtracting a percentage but even with the percentage subtracted using um, using some of these companies it's still just an incredible way to raise money um, even in, you know, across, across the globe. It's just a really powerful way um, for families to be able to raise money. So we're exploring other options. <laughs>